Sometimes the smallest changes make the biggest impact, and Trade Coffee is a great addition to your morning routine. Trade brings you roasted-to-order coffee from more than 55 of the nation's top roasters right to your doorstep. Stay tuned for a new special offer for Killer Instinct listeners in just a moment. I don't know about you guys, but March is always a time of year for me where I need pick-me-ups, and my trade deliveries are always a bright spot in my week. Trade is a subscription service that sources the best coffee from local roasters across across the country and brings it to your doorstep so you can enjoy their craft from the comfort of your own home. There's multiple ways to experience coffee with trade. Sign up for your subscription or try one of their starter packs today. Not only is Trade Coffee absolutely delicious with so many options to choose from, but I'm someone who truly values comfort and convenience, and having my Trade Coffee on a subscription service so I don't have to think or worry about it truly does make my life so much easier, and I know that every morning I'm waking up to a delicious cup of coffee. I literally go to bed dreaming about it. So jumpstart your daily coffee routine by signing up for a Trade subscription. Right now, Trade is offering up to $15 off select plans, and you get your first bag of coffee free. Just visit drinktrade.com slash killer. That's drinktrade.com slash killer for a free bag and up to $15 off select subscription plans. Drinktrade.com slash killer. Hello, you guys. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. Thank you guys so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday and you are not going to want to miss it. Now, You guys, as you can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are diving into the case of OJ Simpson. As I've mentioned before, we are dedicating March to celebrity cases, and there truly was no way we could go through celebrity cases without diving into the OJ Simpson case. This case was highly requested by you guys, honestly, the most highly requested one, once I let you guys know what March's True Crime Month was being dedicated towards, and I knew, and you guys knew, that we needed to cover this case. This case truly is one of the most infamous celebrity cases and I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Orenthal James Simpson, who went by the name O.J. Simpson, was born on July 9th, 1947 in San Francisco, California to his parents, Jimmy Lee and Eunice Simpson. Jimmy worked as a chef and also participated in drag while his mother worked as a hospital administrator. Life growing up for OJ didn't come without its own sets of challenges. OJ's father, Jimmy, was an alcoholic, which caused him to have a strained relationship with his wife and kids. OJ was the oldest of four. He had a younger brother named Melvin, a younger sister named Shirley, and another sister named Carmelita, so all three of them witnessed the effects of what alcohol did to their father, and ultimately his parents did end up divorcing in 1952 when OJ was only five years old. Now, after the separation, OJ really was primarily raised by his mother. Eunice was a single mom and trying to do whatever she could to make a good life for her kids. All of them lived in the housing projects of San Francisco, and in his early teenage years, this is when OJ kind of started getting involved with the wrong crowds. He started joining a street gang, and this is where the snowball of effect of getting in trouble with the law really began for him. OJ ended up getting arrested three times, all while in high school. He attended Galileo High School. However, right after his third arrest, this is when things started to change for OJ. After OJ's third arrest is when his gym teacher brought in baseball star Willie Mays. Now, at the time, Willie was an outfielder for the San Francisco Giants and was brought in to talk to the students about sports, personal 
perseverance and determination. Now, OJ had always been wildly athletic his whole life, and at the time that he met Willie, OJ had been dominating in football and track specifically. Now, like I mentioned, at the time that OJ had met Willie, OJ was really going down a rabbit hole of bad behavior. However, this talk with Willie Mays and meeting him really was a turning point for OJ. OJ was really inspired by his conversation with Willie, hearing Willie talk about the motivation that he had and the determination that he had to stay focused on his goals. This really put things into perspective for OJ and OJ realized that he needed to shift his priorities when it came to thinking about his future and really lean into being an athlete. This is when OJ really put all of his focus into playing football. Now, even though OJ was a phenomenal athlete, his grades, on the other hand, and his academics did not stand out as much. And due to his grades not being where they needed to be, it really prevented OJ from getting much interest from college recruiters because he didn't meet those academic requirements that those colleges had. Now, because of this, OJ ended up enrolling in City College of San Francisco in 1965 after he graduated high school. Once he was there, he immediately immersed himself in football and his team actually won a championship. They won the championship bowl against Long Beach State. And it was during this bowl that OJ was able to show off some of his skills and his talent to recruiters who he had not been able to play for prior to this. And it was after this championship bowl that many of those recruiters began to seek out OJ. They wanted OJ to play for their schools. And it was after many meetings and many conversations that OJ finally decided to enroll at USC, the University of Southern California. Now, OJ really shined at USC. And quite honestly, I could sit here and give you all of his statistics, but quite frankly, that's not what we're here for. And I wouldn't really know how to properly relay that information anyways. But just know that OJ was incredibly, incredibly talented. And he was even a runner up for the Heisman Trophy in 1967. And that same year in 1967, at the age of 19 years old, OJ got married to his first wife, Margaret Whitley. And the two had three children together. However, sadly, their youngest ended up drowning in the family swimming pool at two years old and passed away. Now, Margaret and OJ began dating while in high school and all throughout the beginning of OJ's college career. And she really supported him all throughout his football endeavors, being there, wanting to make sure that he was successful and succeeded. She really was his biggest cheerleader at the time. Margaret herself said that during high school, when OJ was getting involved in the wrong crowd, she described him as a very awful person. He was not someone that anyone wanted to be around. He was just getting involved with the wrong types of things. However, sports gave OJ a new purpose. Now, after college, OJ was put into the NFL draft where he ended up getting selected by the Buffalo Bills in 1969. At the time, the Buffalo Bills had the first pick in the draft and they took OJ. Now, OJ was actually able to land the largest contract in professional sports at the time, which was $650,000 over a period of five years. Now, while OJ's first several seasons with the Bills did prove to be difficult because he was trying to prove himself on the team and be accepted by his teammates, and a lot of his teammates at the time really deemed OJ as this hot shot. And while a lot of that did have to do with the contract that OJ signed, like I said, it was the largest contract in professional sports at that time, it also had to do with OJ's ego. OJ had a very specific persona about him. Many people called him arrogant. Many people called him egotistical. Many people called him full of himself. And because of that, it made it difficult for his teammates to accept him. However, over time, he was able to break through and truly shine as a football player on the Buffalo Bills. His talent truly was unlike anything that anyone had really ever seen before. And when people watched OJ play football, they could tell that this is what he was meant to do. He was meant to be an athlete. He was meant to play this sport. Then in 1977, after being with the Bills for eight seasons, OJ ended up getting traded. And this time he was going to the San Francisco 49ers. Now, OJ was actually very excited about this because obviously he is from San Francisco. So being able to play for his home team was a very full circle moment for him. And he was really just proud of how far he had come in his career. Now, ultimately, OJ's final game 
name was on December 16th, 1979, and over the course of his career, he was placed at second place for the NFL's all-time rushing list for rushing yards, and he currently sits at 21st place. He was also named the NFL Player of the Year in 1973 and played in six Pro Bowls. Now, I'm going to backtrack for a moment to 1977, so two years prior to OJ's football retirement. In 1977, not only was this a big year for OJ because he was being traded from the Bills to the 49ers, but this was also a big year for OJ because this would be the year that OJ met a waitress at a Beverly Hills nightclub called The Daisy, and this woman was named Nicole Brown. Nicole Brown was born on May 19th, 1959 in Frankfurt, West Germany to her parents, Judith and Louis Brown. Her mother was German and her father was American and the two met while Louis was stationed in Germany. Now, initially, Judith and Louis set up their life in Frankfurt, Germany, and they had two daughters, Nicole and Denise. When the girls were toddlers, the family decided to make the move back to the United States where they moved to Garden Grove, California. Now, once they got back to the States, they welcomed two more daughters, Dominique and Tanya. Nicole went to school at Rancho Alamitos in Garden Grove, California, and then graduated from Dana Hills High School in 1976. Now, Nicole really didn't have much trouble adjusting to the California lifestyle at all. She was tall, blonde, tan, someone that everyone really gravitated towards. Nicole loved the beach as a teenager. She loved the ocean, and she was also named Homecoming Princess at Dana Hills High School. Now, Nicole actually met OJ when she was only 18 years old and OJ was 30. Now, once they started dating, it did not take long for both of them to completely fall head over heels for each other. Now, I do want to mention that OJ was still married when he first met Nicole. However, he ended up divorcing his first wife in 1979 to pursue the relationship with Nicole and Nicole and OJ got married on February 2nd, 1985. Now, soon after they had two children together. They had a son and a daughter, and Nicole was an amazing mother. It was said that she would have done anything and everything for her children. She cared about her kids more than anything in the world and wanted to create a life for them that was safe and joyful and happy. She prioritized her kids above all else. Now, while everything was looking very idyllic and perfect for the Simpson family on the outside, behind closed doors, this family was far from it. Throughout their marriage, Nicole and OJ had several main pain points that caused their marriage to deteriorate, and one of the bigger ones was the affairs that OJ had. OJ had multiple affairs during their marriage, and Nicole would find out about these affairs, and as you can imagine, it would make her absolutely infuriated. Now, instead of being apologetic or attempting to change or get help for his behavior, go to therapy or counseling, OJ really did didn't seem to care that he was getting caught for these affairs. In fact, he would go out in public with these women and really seem to rub these affairs in Nicole's face. It got to the point where he was not trying to hide these affairs whatsoever. Paparazzi would catch him being openly affectionate with other women, and those photos would circulate back to Nicole, and it just seemed as if OJ did not care. Now, when it came to OJ's personality, something to note about him is that he always had a way of charming people. It was said that wherever you would go, if you went somewhere with OJ, he had this charisma about him that made him just get away with anything and everything. Anywhere he would go, people would either pick up his bill, he would get into anywhere he wanted just because he was OJ. And while that also had to do with his celebrity status and success, OJ definitely knew how to work a room. However, over time, those closest to OJ said that that charm and charisma slowly turned into being arrogant. Those who know OJ have commented on his charming personality and said that OJ used his charm to his advantage and would use people to get exactly what he wanted, and this included other women. OJ was known to be a womanizer. He had women chasing after him, and that kind of validation
manipulation by so many women only continued to grow his ego. And those who knew him said that he felt entitled to have as many women as he wanted. And that fed into this narrative of him not caring about these affairs. To him, he was OJ and it didn't matter. He was going to do what he wanted and he didn't care if he got caught. Now, while the affairs were definitely a very big problem in Nicole and OJ's marriage, the biggest issue, however, was the domestic violence and physical abuse that Nicole endured at the hands of OJ. By 1989, police had been called eight times to the Simpson residence for domestic violence instances. However, OJ was allegedly always able to talk himself out of trouble whenever police would arrive to the house. On January 1st, 1989, Nicole called the police again to report another instance of domestic violence. When police arrived to the house, they walked up to the front gate that had an electric buzzer. And when police rang the buzzer, that's when they said that Nicole jumped out from the bushes wearing nothing but a bra and sweatpants saying please help he's going to kill me the gate opened and nicole ran to the officer and wrapped her arms around him nicole had scratches all over her body and was covered in mud and was repeating he's going to kill me the police asked who's going to kill you and that's when nicole replied oj now, according to the officer who arrived on the scene, while he was speaking to Nicole, this is when OJ came out of the house screaming, quote, I don't want her in my bed anymore. I have two other women and I don't want that woman in my bed anymore, end quote. Now, the police did approach OJ and told him that he needed to go back in the house and get changed because they were placing him under arrest for assaulting Nicole. So police tell OJ this and they allow him to walk into the house by himself. He's not escorted. He's not followed into the home. They allow him to go into the home by himself and change into a different pair of clothes. However, moments later, this is when police heard a car starting in the driveway that backed out and sped off and police were never able to catch up with him. Sometimes the smallest changes make the biggest impact, and Trade Coffee is a great addition to your morning routine. Trade brings you roasted-to-order coffee from more than 55 of the nation's top roasters right to your doorstep. Stay tuned for a new special offer for Killer Instinct listeners in just a moment. I don't know about you guys, but March is always a time of year for me where I need pick-me-ups, and my trade deliveries are always a bright spot in my week. Trade is a subscription service that sources the best coffee from local roasters across Across the country and brings it to your doorstep so you can enjoy their craft from the comfort of your own home. There's multiple ways to experience coffee with trade. Sign up for your subscription or try one of their starter packs today. Not only is Trade Coffee absolutely delicious with so many options to choose from, but I'm someone who truly values comfort and convenience, and having my Trade Coffee on a subscription service so I don't have to think or worry about it truly does make my life so much easier, and I know that every morning I'm waking up to a delicious cup of coffee. I literally go to bed dreaming about it. So jumpstart your daily coffee routine by signing up for a Trade subscription. Right now, Trade is offering up to $15 off select plans, and you get your first bag of coffee free. Just visit drinktrade.com slash killer. That's drinktrade.com slash killer for a free bag and up to $15 off select subscription plans. Drinktrade.com slash killer. Now, the following day, this is when OJ actually got in contact with someone that he knew who worked for LAPD at the time, and this was a man named Ron Shipp, and again, this was a friend of OJ's. When OJ called Ron, OJ told him about the incident from the night prior, and not surprisingly, OJ told Ron that Nicole had attacked him and that he had to hold her down and needed to defend himself. Now, according to Ron, he said that because of the way that OJ told the story, Ron told OJ that this was no big deal and not to worry because if Nicole really was being aggressive towards him, then OJ is all good and in the clear. Now, the following day when Ron went to work, he got notified that someone wanted to speak with him and that person was Nicole Brown Simpson. Nicole and Ron started talking about that January 1st incident and Nicole had asked if Ron had heard about it. Ron said yes. And this is when Nicole told Ron that this was not the first time that something like this has happened. 
Nicole ended up showing Ron a bunch of old pictures from previous assaults that she had taken as proof that OJ had been physically abusing her for quite some time. And according to Ron, he said that this is when the narrative really changed here for him and he started to see what was really going on between OJ and Nicole. And that was that OJ was an abuser. Now, when it comes to the January 1st incident, you might be sitting here wondering, why was OJ allowed to walk back into the house by himself? Why was he not escorted? Why was he not arrested right then and there? And according to the LAPD officers who were working at the time, they really said that OJ got treated in this specific way simply because he was OJ Simpson, plain and simple. Now, OJ did ultimately get arrested for this January 1st incident. However, Nicole dropped the charges. And part of this was because allegedly Nicole's inner circle was telling her to forgive OJ and try to reconcile for the sake of their family. Now, this fight became public knowledge and the media got a hold of it. And once that happened, it put a lot of deals that OJ had at risk. OJ had many commercials that were lined up for him. He had different endorsements and sponsorships, and none of these companies wanted someone who was accused of domestic violence as the face of these endorsements. And so because of this, OJ and Nicole did a lot of damage control on this fight and went public and said that it was just a fight that got blown out of proportion. Nicole ended up calling the Hertz rental car CEO who OJ was working with at the time and told him that the whole fight was a misunderstanding and that OJ was not abusive. So because of this, they were really trying to backpedal to the public. OJ came forward and did several interviews talking about the fight, talking about the label that he was receiving as a wife beater and used his charm once again to be able to convince people that he was not a monster. So even though Nicole and OJ were doing damage control to the public and trying to show the public that everything was fine, they were okay, they just had a fight and the media blew it out of proportion, behind closed doors, things were not going as smoothly. Nicole was still very much not happy with OJ and did not know if she was wanting to continue in her marriage. And this is when OJ reached out to Ron again directly and asked Ron if he could relay the message to Nicole that, OJ is going to change. OJ is going to get help. He's going to work on being better for his family. And for all things considered, for the next few weeks, it really seemed like this was the case. Nicole told Ron that it really seemed like OJ was changing his ways. The two of them were getting along again. OJ was really being active with the kids and doing things with them. And that was always the biggest thing for Nicole. Like I mentioned earlier, her kids were her number one priority. And Nicole told not only police, but her friends and family as well, that if it weren't for the children, she would have left the marriage a long time ago. So for Nicole, a lot of this was really wanting to keep her family together. Now, there was another part of this as well, where Nicole was financially dependent on OJ and had been that way from the moment that they met. Nicole met OJ when she was 18 years old, and the idea of leaving OJ and starting completely over, that was an intimidating and daunting concept for her. However, ultimately, on February 25th, 1992, Nicole Brown Simpson filed for divorce from OJ after seven years of marriage, citing irreconcilable differences being the reason for the divorce. Now, along with the domestic violence and the physical abuse, the straw that was really said to have broke the camel's back in this marriage was when OJ told Nicole about an affair that he had been having for a year with a woman named Tawny Katen. Now, Tawny was an actress, and the affair ended when Tawny got married to a different man in 1989. And when Nicole learned of this affair, this is when she knew that she could no longer go on in the marriage with OJ. Now, after filing for divorce, the two did not officially stop seeing each other. Obviously, they had their children and had to see each other for their children's sake. However, they would go on vacations together with their kids. They would see each other from time to time. And according to OJ's friends, his friends claimed that OJ would often talk about the possibility of reconciling, with Nicole and getting remarried, he was not under the impression that this was the end-all be-all for him and Nicole. He couldn't wrap his head around the fact that Nicole no longer wanted to be with him. He really phrased this to his friends as the two of them were just on a break, they were going to work things out, and everything was going to be fine. But for Nicole, this is when Nicole was really entering a new era of life that she felt excited about for the first time in a very, very long time. She moved into a new home that was still 
close to OJ, but it was her own space for her and her kids. She was ready to put the marriage with OJ behind her and really focus on herself and her children, something that she hadn't been able to do for quite some time. According to Nicole's friends, they claim that Nicole was excited to just be Nicole. She didn't want to be Mrs. Simpson any longer. She didn't want to be OJ's wife. She just wanted to be Nicole Brown, and she was excited to start whatever chapter that looked like for her. There were a lot of unknowns, but instead of being intimidated by it, she was excited about it. She was excited about starting a career, potentially in photography. That was something that she was very passionate about, and she really just wanted to live a normal life at this point. Now, after some time, Nicole did start getting into the dating world again, and she started putting herself out there and met a man named Keith. Now, Keith and Nicole were in the early stages of getting to know each other and enjoying each other's company, but OJ, as you can imagine, was not happy that Nicole was moving on with her life and dating other people. According to Keith, he claimed that there was one time where he was at dinner with Nicole and some friends when all of a sudden, OJ stormed in, slammed his hands on the table, looked at Keith, and told him, quote, I'm OJ Simpson, and that's still my wife. End quote. On another instance in April 1992, Nicole and Keith went to a club together when Nicole spotted OJ and realized that they were being followed by him. Nicole and Keith immediately left the club and went back to Nicole's house. And once they got to the house, Keith and Nicole became intimate and began having sex. And the next day, OJ came to Nicole's home enraged. He demanded that he spoke with Nicole privately, and Nicole agreed that this was okay. Now, Keith waited in the other room, and according to him, he remembered hearing OJ screaming at Nicole. He was calling her all kinds of names, saying all sorts of horrible things, and Keith remembered that when the conversation was done, OJ walked out of the room that they were in, looked at Keith, and... OJ was back to being OJ. He turned the charm on again. He shook Keith's hand and he acted like everything was fine before walking out the door. Now, after OJ left, Nicole told Keith what OJ had told her, which was that OJ had followed the two of them home the night prior and watched them have sex through the window. Now, this really was only the beginning of the stalking that OJ was doing to Nicole. Even after Nicole stopped seeing Keith, OJ would follow Nicole around, and if it wasn't OJ following Nicole around directly, OJ would have other people follow her around, other people watch where she was going, who she was hanging out with, what she was doing. Now, after some time, Nicole and OJ actually did try and work through things again. OJ was able to use his charm to try and manipulate himself back into Nicole's life. And to Nicole, she desperately wanted her family to be a family. That was something that she always emphasized to her friends, to her family. She wanted her kids to have a two-parent household. She wanted her family to be whole again. And so because of this, OJ used this to his advantage. He knew what to say to Nicole. And so he would tell her that they could get the family back together. And again, just use his charm to manipulate his way back back into Nicole's life. And Nicole wrote in her diary that she wanted to work on things and she wanted to work on putting her family back together. However, Nicole learned quickly that things were not going to change. In late October, 1993, Nicole called 911 again, saying that OJ had broken through the back door of the home and was attacking her. At the time that she called 911, Nicole was hiding in the closet and in the background of the 911 call, you can hear OJ screaming. He's talking poorly about Nicole's old boyfriend, Keith, talking poorly on Nicole as well. And OJ was doing this all while the kids were upstairs sleeping. Now on the call, Nicole told the operator, quote, he's going to beat the shit out of me end quote. Now, when police arrived, OJ calmed down, turned the charm on yet again. He admitted that he broke the door and agreed to replace it, and Nicole refused to press charges against him. 
Now, something that I briefly mentioned that I want to dive a little bit deeper into is Nicole's diary entries. Nicole had documented her life through these diary entries and explicitly detailed her life with OJ. In the diary, Nicole made an entry about the first time OJ was allegedly abusive towards Nicole. She wrote, quote, the first time he beat me up was after Lewis and Annie Mary anniversary party. Started on the street corner of New York, Fifth Avenue at about 9 p.m. He threw me on the floor hit me, kicked me. We went to the hotel where he continued to beat me for hours and I continued crawling to the door. He called my mother a whore, end quote. In another updated entry, Nicole talked about how OJ hit her car with a baseball bat when she came home later than she expected. Another entry talked about how when Nicole was pregnant with their son, OJ got drunk and kicked Nicole out of the house, calling her fat and pointed a gun at her. Now, all in all, Nicole documented 62 different incidents of abuse in this diary, eight of which police got involved in. Now, Nicole also described in her entries about not only how physical physically abusive OJ was, but how psychologically controlling he was as well. OJ made sure that Nicole dressed a certain way, she fed a certain image that he wanted to portray to the public, everything down to the hair and the makeup that Nicole was wearing, it all had to be approved by OJ. In a diary entry on Sunday, May 22, 1994, Nicole wrote, quote, we're officially split, end quote. So this all brings us to several weeks later after that last diary entry on June 12th, 1994. Now at the time, Nicole had met a man named Ron Goldman. Ron was a 25-year-old waiter who grew up in Buffalo Grove, Illinois, but moved to Los Angeles with hopes of opening his own restaurant and bar and was working as a waiter at a restaurant called Mezzaluna in the meantime. Now, Ron and Nicole had met six weeks prior to this, so they were very new in their friendship, and the two had spent time grabbing coffee and dinner over the weeks getting to know each other, but the two were simply only platonic friends at this time. Now, on June 12th, Nicole and her family attended her daughter's dance recital, and OJ was there as well. Now, afterwards, at about 6.30 p.m., Nicole, her kids, Nicole's mom, and several others went to dinner at that Mezzaluna restaurant where Ron had worked. Now, Ron was not the server this night. However, they did go there and all enjoyed a very nice dinner together that OJ was not a part of. Now, at 8 p.m., they left the restaurant and Nicole and the kids went to get ice cream on the way home. At approximately 9.15, one of Nicole's sisters called Mezzaluna because Nicole's mom had left her glasses at the restaurant. Now, like I mentioned, Ron was working that night, and so he told Nicole's sister that he would bring the glasses to Nicole's house after his shift. Now, Ron clocked out of his shift at 9.33 p.m. and stayed at the restaurant until about 9.45 p.m. to have a bottle of water before he left. After leaving the restaurant, he stopped by his own apartment in Brentwood before walking the 10-minute walk to Nicole's condo. Nicole was living at 875 South Bundy Drive in Brentwood, California. At the time that she lived there, this was a 3,400 three-story townhome with four bedrooms and four bedrooms bathrooms. In the front of the house, there was a walkway that led you to the front gate before entering into the home. Now, at approximately 10 15 p.m. that night, Nicole's neighbor, Eva Stein, she began hearing a dog barking loudly for approximately 30 minutes until about 10 47 p.m. She described the dog barking as being nonstop, and it didn't sound like a normal bark. It sounded like an alerting bark. It sounded more intense. Now, Eva's boyfriend, Louis, Lewis arrived home no later than 10.45 p.m., and when he got home, he noticed the dog barking as well. When Lewis arrived home, he opened the front door to grab his mail, and that is when he noticed that the dog that was barking was Nicole's dog, Cato. Now, around the same time, around 10.55 p.m., there was another neighbor named Stephen Schwab who was walking his own dog through the neighborhood that night. Now, according to Stephen, he said that along his walk, he saw Cato in the middle of the street. Cato looked dirty. He looked like he had mud on his paws. However, when Stephen got a closer look, he realized that it wasn't mud or dirt on Cato, but that it was actually 
blood. Now, when Steven came across Cato, he did not know that this was Nicole's dog. He just saw this dog barking in the middle of the street, did not know who this dog belonged to, and Lewis at this time had actually gone inside. So he was already inside. He wasn't out there to say, oh yes, that's Nicole's dog, because he had already just turned around and gone back in for the night, not thinking too much of it. So because of that, he didn't really know what to make of it, so he just continued on his walk home, which was about two and a half blocks away. However, Cato followed Stephen all the way back to Stephen's apartment. Now, once they got back to Stephen's house, Stephen gave Cato some water before putting him on a leash and tried to have Cato lead him back to where he lived. He thought maybe if he let Cato lead the way that they would go back to wherever Cato was from. But Cato kept pulling away from Bundy Drive, which was where Nicole lived. And ultimately, Stephen really did not know what to do at this point. So he decided that he was going to bring Cato back to his apartment, which he did. And upon doing that, that is when Stephen ran into his downstairs neighbor. Steven's downstairs neighbor was a man named Sucru, and Sucru and his wife decided that they would keep Kato for the night. So Sucru and his wife take Kato in for the night, but Kato was very anxious and a little bit agitated. So after some time, Sucru and his wife decided to walk Kato back to where Steven found him. Steven told Sucru that he found him near South Bundy Drive, and so Sucru and his wife decide to walk back towards that area. Now, this time on the walk, Kato did did allow them to walk down Bundy towards Nicole's house. And the closer they got to the home, the more Cato was pulling before ultimately he stopped right in front of Nicole's home. And that is when Sucru and his wife saw the front gate to the house wide open and a woman laying on the front steps of her home covered in blood. Sucru and his wife immediately called 911 and police arrived on the scene shortly after. Now, when police arrived on to the scene, they found the lights on in the home, there was music playing, and the body of a woman was laying at the bottom of the steps covered in blood. But that wasn't all. Upon walking towards the woman who was lying at the bottom of the steps, police discovered another body, this time of a man who was just a few feet away from the woman lying in the bushes. Both the woman and the man were fully clothed, but it was clear that both of them had been stabbed from all of the wounds covering their bodies. Bodies. Now, one of the first things that police noticed about the crime scene was how much blood there was. There was blood absolutely everywhere around this crime scene, and this was very indicative to police that this was a crime of passion and rage. Now, not long after police arrived to the crime scene, did they learn that the woman that was lying dead at the bottom of the steps was in fact Nicole Brown, and the man was Ron Goldman. Now, now, Nicole's kids were sleeping upstairs in their rooms while all of this was going on, and when police looked at Nicole, they concluded that she was the intended target of this attack because her murder definitely seemed more like a crime of passion. She had been stabbed multiple times in her head, her neck, and there were also multiple defensive wounds on her hands. She had a large bruise in the center of her back as well as a footprint right where that bruise was, and investigators believe that Nicole was attacked first, then Ron was killed, and then the killer returned back to Nicole a second time, stood on her back, pulled her head back by her hair, and slit her throat. The fatal wound to Nicole was that slit to her throat that severed her choroided artery. Nicole's injuries were so bad that her head was barely attached to her body when investigators found her. Now, when it came to Ron, he had also been stabbed multiple times on his body and neck, but there weren't as many defensive wounds on him, and it's believed that whoever did this stabbed Ron while having him in a chokehold, leaving him unable to defend himself. Now, when examining the house, police discovered multiple different items. The first item that they collected into evidence was Nicole's mother's glasses that were found in an envelope. The second item that was brought into evidence was a dark brown leather left hand glove. Now, the glove was an extra large Aris isotonic light leather glove. Along with that, police found a trail of blood leaving the house and going toward the back gate. Now, there were some extra 
extra drops of blood by the footprints leaving the house, which told police that the assailant could have injured himself during the killings as well. Now, because OJ was the next of kin to Nicole at the time, the divorce was not officially finalized. Police knew that they needed to notify him. So because of this, police went over to OJ's house, which was approximately two miles, about five to 10 minutes away from where Nicole was living. Now, when police arrived to the home, they got there at approximately 5 a.m. They rang the buzzer at the front gate. However, they received no answer. Now, because of this, police really didn't know what they were dealing with here. They didn't know if someone had also gone after OJ as well, if OJ was alive or not. So they ended up jumping the fence and knocking directly on the front door. Now, when they did this, they were met with a man named Brian Kalen, also known as Cato, which yes, was also the name of Nicole's dog. So two separate Catos here. Now, Cato was a family friend of the Simpsons, and he was actually living in the guest house of OJ's home at the time. Now, when police got there, police asked Cato where OJ was, and that is when Cato told police that OJ was actually on a flight to Chicago at that time. Cato explained that OJ had a late night flight to Chicago the night prior. Now, while police continued speaking with Cato, there was another investigator who walked the perimeter of the home, and when they were doing that, that is when they discovered a singular dark brown leather right hand glove lying on the ground. And just off of first glance, this glove seemed to be an identical match to the left hand glove that was found at Nicole's crime scene. Now, police also saw OJ's white Ford Bronco car parked outside of the home, and they saw what appeared to be a very small blood stain by the right door handle on the driver's side. By 7 a.m. on the 13th, detectives were able to get a search warrant for OJ's house and an arrest warrant out for OJ Simpson. Now, OJ returned back from Chicago the next day on Monday, and immediately upon arriving home, he was placed in handcuffs. Now, OJ agreed to go down to the police station to speak with detectives, which was actually very shocking to everyone. No one really expected him to volunteer to do that and be so willing to talk to police. And when they got into the interview room, police noticed a cut on OJ's hand, and they asked him about it. And initially, he said that he didn't remember where he got the cut on his hand. However, later on said that he cut his hand on broken glass while he was in Chicago. Now, there was a lot of scrutiny towards the detectives who conducted this interview once the interview was released or parts of it were released because some of the public believed that the detectives weren't really asking OJ the hard-hitting questions. They were almost letting him go on these tangents and ramble on these stories without fact-checking him or stopping him in between to ask the hard-hitting questions. However, regardless, police were able to get fingerprints and blood samples from OJ and then after that, he was released. Now, as you can imagine, and as some of you may remember, the media storm that came from this case was un real. Every news channel, every media outlet, everyone was reporting on this. Everyone knew about what was going on and what had happened. The media was parked outside of OJ's home. You had countless fans outside of OJ's home. There were a lot of people who believed in OJ and who didn't think that he was capable of this. A lot of people believed that he was being framed. There were a lot of people that were cheering him on and supporting him through all of this. Now, after after OJ was released after that first initial interview, he went back home and some of his friends came over to see him. Now, according to these friends, they remember when they walked into the house, OJ had every TV on in the house with all different news channels reporting on Nicole's death. Now, if you remember the LAPD friend that I mentioned earlier named Ron, he went over to OJ's house just to see OJ as a friend. Now, when Ron got to OJ's house, he noticed the cut on OJ's finger and he asked OJ about it. Now, when asked about it, OJ gave the same story about how he cut it on glass in Chicago. Now, over the course of the night, when there were more people popping into the house, more people talking to OJ, and there were several other people who had asked OJ about the cut on his finger. And what Ron had noticed was that OJ was giving different stories as to what happened to his finger. 
Ron said that OJ told a different story about how he cut it chipping golf balls and that there was another story that OJ told about how he cut it getting his cell phone out of his car. And this is when Ron initially said that the red flags were starting to pop up for him because OJ was openly telling different people different stories. Now, along with this, OJ also told Ron that he was not going to be taking a polygraph test if police had asked him to do so. And when Ron asked why he was not going to be taking a polygraph test, that is when OJ told him that he had previously had dreams of killing Nicole and OJ was worried that those dreams would alter the results of the polygraph test. Now let's go back to the night of June 12th and talk about what we know OJ did that night. We talked about Nicole's timeline. Let's talk about OJ's. Now what we know is that after OJ's daughter's dance recital, OJ returned back to his house in Brentwood and he and Cato went to McDonald's together before heading back home and parting ways for the night. At 11.15 p.m., OJ was picked up at his house by a limo and driven to LA for his late night flight to Chicago for the Hertz golf event. His flight took off at 11.45 p.m. Now, OJ's defense attorney, his lead defense attorney, was a man named Robert Shapiro. Robert was known as the Hollywood lawyer and as the fixer, as people liked to call him. Robert Shapiro had never been hired for a murder case, so because of this, he recruited some other people who did have that experience, including F. Lee Bailey, Bill Pavlik, and Rob Kardashian. Now, these lawyers were referred to as the dream team. Shapiro also tried to get Ron Ship on board to defend OJ. However, Ron refused to do so because he told investigators that he truly believed that OJ killed Nicole. And this was really the first time that any of OJ's friends had gone against him. This was the first time that one of his friends had realized and openly stated that he did not believe that OJ was innocent. Now, on June 17th, 1994, OJ was scheduled to surrender himself over to detectives that morning, and this came after the preliminary results from the blood at the crime scene came in, and it came back with a positive match to OJ's DNA. Now, because of this, the DA recommended that OJ be charged with two counts of first-degree murder with special circumstances of multiple killings. Now, OJ was staying at Rob Kardashian home at the time, and Shapiro went over to Kardashian's home the morning of the 17th to really prepare OJ for what was about to happen and told OJ that they had until about noon that day to turn himself in. In. Now, law enforcement allowed that noon time slot because they were giving OJ time to see a mental health specialist because Shapiro was telling the DA that OJ was showing signs of depression, so they wanted to have him see a mental health specialist. So that was the plan. He was going to see this mental health specialist, and then he was going to turn himself in by noon on June 17th. And all of the media outlets, all of the public was made aware of of this. Everyone knew that OJ was turning himself in. And so because of this, you had everyone, the media, the public waiting outside of LAPD to watch OJ turn himself in. However, time began ticking and it started getting closer to noon. Then it became noon and then it passed noon and OJ still did not show up. The LAPD went to Robert Kardashian's home to arrest OJ themselves. However, at that point, he was gone. He was missing. He was on the run. At 1.50 p.m., the LAPD chief spokesman came forward and declared OJ as a fugitive on the run. At 5 p.m., Rob Kardashian came forward and read a letter that OJ had written to the public. In the letter, he said that he had nothing to do with Nicole's death, but that he cannot go on. He said, quote, don't feel sorry for me. I've had a great life great friends. Please think of the real OJ and not this lost person, end quote. OJ's lawyers claimed that they did not know where OJ was. According to them, what had happened is while they were at Rob Kardashian's house with OJ, the lawyers stepped into the other room for a moment and OJ and his best friend, a man named Al Cowlings, were left alone for a few minutes. And when the lawyers came back into the room, OJ and Al were gone. 
Now, at this point, everyone is on the hunt for OJ. LAPD was looking for OJ. The public was looking for OJ. You had news helicopters that were circling the area looking for him. And everyone was out looking for the white Ford Bronco that OJ drives. Now, it wasn't until 6.20 p.m. that day that a motorist notified Highway Patrol after seeing what he believed to be OJ's vehicle on the I-5 freeway heading north. Al was also seen in the car with OJ, and Al was actually actually the one who was driving the car. Now, at this point, Al did get a hold of police. He called the police and told them that he was driving and that OJ was in the passenger seat of the car with a gun pointed to his own head. Now, ultimately, police were able to catch up with the Ford Bronco, and there was a chase that lasted for an incredibly long time time. Now, everyone, the public, the media, everyone was very surprised how calm the police were being about this scenario, about this chase. It was not a high-speed chase by any means. You had about 20 police cars just casually following OJ's white Bronco. And they did this for quite some time. And police were speaking to Al during some moments of this chase, quote unquote. And Al was telling them that they were heading towards OJ's house and that OJ wanted to speak with his mom. So with this new information that Al is saying that they are going to OJ's house in Brentwood, police sent out 27 SWAT officers to wait outside of OJ's home. Now, OJ and Al pulled up to the Brentwood residence, OJ's home, at about 8 o'clock p.m. Al initially got out of the car and told police not to hurt OJ. Please don't hurt him. Don't do anything to him. Really trying to be there for his friend. However, ultimately, police pushed Al to the side. They removed him from the scene. Now, it was just OJ in the car, and OJ had a gun. And at this point, OJ was on the phone with a negotiator who was trying to negotiate to get OJ out of the car. Now, this negotiation lasted about 45 minutes before ultimately OJ got out of the car at 8.50 p.m. and then went inside of his home. During the time that he was inside, he reportedly spoke to his mom, drank a glass of orange juice, and had a sandwich. OJ's lawyers arrived to the home while all of this was happening, and OJ was ultimately arrested. Inside of the Ford Bronco, police found $8,000 in cash, a change of clothing, a suicide note, a three fifty seven. Magnum gun, a passport, and a disguised kit with a fake mustache. Now, OJ was arrested and booked at Parker Center, and Al Cowlings was booked on suspicion of harboring a fugitive, so he was also arrested. On June 20th, OJ was arraigned and pled not guilty to both murders. However, this time, he was held without bail. The trial itself began on January 24th, 1995, so seven months following the murders. Now, this trial lasted quite some time, and the prosecution in this case basically presented all of the evidence that I had laid out here for you today while talking about this case and spoke about all of the domestic violence instances that occurred between OJ and Nicole, and then ultimately how they believe that that led to the murder of Nicole. The prosecution explained how on the night of the murder, OJ was upset with Nicole at their daughter's dance recital and made a comment about her dress being too tight. Now, after the dance recital, OJ went home and got a voicemail from his girlfriend that he had been seeing at the time, and the voicemail was essentially her ending their relationship. It is then believed that OJ went over to Nicole's house in hopes to reconcile their relationship, and when Nicole refused, OJ OJ killed her as his final act of control. Now, the medical examiner testified that Nicole's death was sometime between 10 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. on June 12th. And the prosecution really emphasized the fact that OJ did not have an alibi between the times of 9.36 p.m. and 10.54 p.m. that night. 9.36 is the last time that Cato saw OJ. They came back from McDonald's and the two went their separate ways from the night. So 9.36 was the last time that Cato saw him. Now, the driver, the limo driver that took OJ to the airport for his flight to Chicago that night arrived at OJ's home at 10.25 p.m. However, OJ was not there. 
It wasn't until a little after 11 p.m. that OJ ended up getting picked up. So OJ was not there when the limo driver first arrived. Now, the prosecution also spoke of the DNA evidence. OJ's blood was found next to the bloody footprints at the crime scene. His DNA was found outside of the door of his Bronco car. His DNA was found on the bloody glove that was found at his house. But not only that, Nicole and Ron's DNA was found on that glove too. And along with that, OJ and Nicole's blood DNA were found on a pair of socks that were discovered in OJ's bedroom. Now, the probability for error in these results were in the billions. Now, it should also be noted that OJ had purchased a 12-inch knife six weeks prior to the murders. The medical examiner looked at the knife and determined that it was similar to the one that caused the stab wounds. However, the prosecution did not present this at trial after there were tests done on the knife that showed showed that the knife had never been used. Now, when it came to the defense, the defense was really just trying to create reasonable doubt in this case. They tried arguing that the evidence against OJ, the DNA evidence was compromised, and that OJ was being framed for Nicole and Ron's murder. They also tried to say that OJ was not physically capable of committing this crime because he had chronic arthritis and old football injuries. Now, a big thing for the defense, if you remember this trial, if you remember watching it or hearing about it later, a big thing in this case was the leather glove. The defense argued that the glove that was found at OJ's house was planted by an officer named Mark Furman. The defense claimed that Furman planted the glove because he was racist towards OJ. They theorized that Furman found the glove at Nicole's house, picked it up with a stick, put it in a plastic bag and then drove over to OJ's home where he then planted the glove. And when it came to these gloves, the prosecution actually brought a Bloomingdale's cashier to the witness stand who claimed that OJ had purchased the same type of glove in the same size as the ones that were found on the crime scene in 1990 at a Bloomingdale's store. Now, during the trial, OJ was asked to put these gloves on. He was asked to put the gloves on, and this was a big thing in the trial. However, when he put these gloves on, the gloves were too small. They did not fit. And this, for the defense, was a home run for them. This was like a gold mine because if the gloves don't fit OJ, how would they be OJ's gloves? That was their whole defense here. They can't be OJ's gloves because they're too small for him. Now, the prosecution tried to defend this by saying that the blood that was at the crime scene, the blood that these gloves were lying in, caused the gloves to shrink. However, the defense said that OJ, he can't change the size of his hands. If the gloves don't fit, it's because they're not OJ's gloves. Now, during the trial, the prosecution did bring out the vice president of the glove company to testify, and he said that those extra large gloves had shrunk from their original size. They then brought in in a new pair of the extra large gloves, and those ones did end up fitting OJ. So after both the prosecution and the defense presented their case, and after closing arguments were done, on October 3rd, 1995, after two hours of deliberation, OJ was found not guilty on both counts of murder. I think everyone was shocked when they heard this. I think OJ was shocked when he heard this. A hundred million people tuned in and listened to this verdict announcement, and there were a lot of OJ fans who, like I said, were happy about this verdict, but then you had a lot of people who were absolutely gutted by this verdict as well. It was heartbreaking to see all of this evidence and for him to be found not guilty. Based off of all of the evidence, it seemed almost unfathomable that OJ would not be found guilty. However, he was now free. Now, even though OJ was found not guilty, there were some questionable comments made by OJ after this trial. OJ did an interview with Esquire magazine where he said, quote, let's say I committed this crime. Even if I did this, it would have been because I loved her very much, right? 
end quote. Now, in 1996, the parents of Ron Goldman and the father of Nicole Brown filed a civil lawsuit against OJ for wrongful death. The trial was not televised, and the evidence was pretty much the same as the initial trial, except there was more additional evidence about the domestic violence between OJ and Nicole. OJ also took a polygraph test where it showed extreme deception when he denied committing the murders. And this time, the jury did ultimately find OJ liable for the murders, and the victim's families were awarded $33.5 million, and OJ filed for bankruptcy and moved to Florida. So he didn't have to serve any jail time for this. And that, you guys, is the case of OJ Simpson, Nicole Brown, and Ron Goldman. As I said from the beginning, this is one of the crazier celebrity cases that we have covered. It's one of the crazier cases I have seen just in terms of the amount of evidence that was produced and the verdict of not guilty. I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about it. I'm very interested to know your thoughts, your theories, your opinions. So please let me know in the comments below. And with that being said, you guys, that's going to be all for me today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button that way you never miss an episode we post weekly on the podcast every single wednesday and you're not going to want to miss it i'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys and until then stay safe bye guys